Well, welcome to another installment of HeadFirst JavaScript Programming Teasers. When you're learning a new language like JavaScript, you'll have a lot of questions. Not just questions about how the programming language works, but also questions about best practices, like what kinds of variable names are good, and how you should indent your code, and where you should declare your variables, and what's the best way to make your code run fast. So in this installment of HeadFirst JavaScript Programming Teasers, we take a look at some of the best practices to keep in mind as you learn JavaScript and as you write code. Some of these best practices help you write readable code, which in turn helps make code easier to understand and easier to maintain. Some of these best practices also help prevent mistakes. These are the kinds of best practices that keep you out of trouble, but it's good to know what kind of trouble you can get into if you don't use them. And some of these help you to write more efficient code, code that will run faster in the browser, which will make people using your code happy. So let's begin with the basics. What should you name your variables? Imagine you get handed a file of JavaScript code written by somebody else, and it looks like this. Take a moment to look at the code. Even if you're an expert JavaScript programmer, it'll take you a few moments to figure out what this code does, and if you aren't an expert programmer, you might be completely stumped. One of the reasons it looks complicated is because of the variable names we're using. None of them mean much of anything, except maybe i, which is often used as a loop variable name. Otherwise, we're kind of at a loss as to what this function is even supposed to do. Okay, what about this version? The names are a lot longer and more descriptive, but now they're so long that the code is not very readable. Okay, now here's a version that works. The variable names are just long enough that they're easy to understand, yet short enough that the code is readable. So when choosing variable names, the best practice is to choose short but readable variable names. This is a best practice in any language, not just JavaScript. Another best practice related to variables is one you've probably heard from us before, and that is to avoid global variables whenever possible. Global variables make it easy to get started with JavaScript because you can just start writing code in between your script tags without having to worry too much about your code structure. But once you get more practice with JavaScript, you're going to want to reduce or eliminate global variables as much as possible. The main reason for this is to avoid name clashes. If you link to another JavaScript file, whether that's your own or a file you've downloaded, like jQuery or underscore, for instance, any variables that have the same name as those in code you've written in the main HTML page or other code that you link to will clash. You can't have two variable names with the same name. If you really need global variables, and there are times that you will, there are a couple of ways you can reduce the potential for name clashes. One is to put all the variables you need to define at the global level inside one global object, and make sure that none of the files you're linking to use that same global object name. For instance, if you link to jQuery, all jQuery variables, properties, and methods are nested within the jQuery global object. You can use that same technique. Picking a good name for your global object that you know is unique will prevent name clashes. Another solution is to use closures. Now, don't worry if you don't understand this now. Once you learn about closures, a topic we cover in detail in Chapter 11 of Head First JavaScript Programming, you can come back and spend more time with the solution. The idea is to use a function to create a closure containing any variables and functions you need to use at the top level and return an object from that function that provides access to those variables and functions. Just like the previous solution, this one object is the only global variable you'll need to create. And of course, picking a unique name is important to avoid clashes with other libraries of code you might link to. This technique is commonly used with libraries like jQuery and Backbone.js. So the most important thing to remember here is to avoid global variables. In general, if you use functions to modularize your code, you should be able to make most of your variables local. However, if you do absolutely need global variables, you can use a global object to encapsulate them. Another best practice related to variables is using the var keyword. JavaScript has a quirk that can bite you when you least expect it. Take a look at this code. 
At the top, we've got a variable named len that's set to 13. That might be the number of items in a list or maybe even the length of a string that we've already processed. And then elsewhere in our code, we've got a function process array. Here, we're using the variable len to hold the length of the array to use when we iterate through the items in the array. We meant for this variable to be different from the global variable len. In fact, we meant it to be a local variable. But notice that we forgot to put the var keyword in front of the variable name, which means that the variable in process array is actually the same variable as the global variable len, and will overwrite the value 13, which isn't what we wanted. This is an easy mistake to make because JavaScript doesn't require that you use the var keyword with new variables. At least it doesn't right now, although it may in a future version. So if you get in the habit of not using var for variables, you end up creating a whole bunch of global variables, which as you now know, can lead to all kinds of name clashes and problems. This kind of bug can be really hard to track down, but it's easy to prevent. To fix it, all we have to do is put var in front of len. So the best practice here is always use var for all your variables and be extra careful with global variables. Make sure you know if you're using a global or a local variable in your functions. When you're writing code, there are a few things you can do to make your code more readable. This is a good thing to do both for yourself when you try to figure out what your code does later, and also your coworkers if you're working on a team. It can also help you avoid some errors that are easy to make if your code isn't readable. Take a look at this code. It's not very pretty. You can probably tell what it does, but by making a few changes, we can make this code a whole lot more readable. We'll start by indenting the code properly. Now already the code is a lot easier to read. And now that we've indented it correctly, we find another problem with the code. We're missing some curly braces on our if statement. Because we neglected to put in the curly braces, we can also see that we've got a bug. We want the last statement, return false, to execute only if the key code is equal to 13. But because we didn't put in our curly braces, the if statement includes only the fire button dot click statement and not the return statement. That means that the return statement will always execute, which isn't quite what we wanted. In this case, it probably doesn't matter too much, but neglecting to add curly braces to if statements, for loops, and while loops can easily create bugs like this, and in fact, this very issue was the cause of a serious security bug recently. So let's fix this code and add in some curly braces. One other thing we can do to improve this code is to add some comments. You don't need to go overboard in creating comments, but a few comments here and there to remind you what a function does or to help you remember why you're doing certain things is always a great idea. You'll thank yourself later when your boss asks you to maintain your code or add a new feature. So the best practice for formatting your code is to indent your code to help make it more readable, Use curly braces whenever you create a block of code, like with an if statement, even if it's just one line of code, and add comments to your code. When JavaScript parses your code, it does something called automatic semicolon insertion. It sounds complicated and perhaps a little painful, but all it really means is that if you forget a semicolon, instead of giving up and creating an error, JavaScript tries to guess where you really meant to put in a semicolon and puts one in for you. So in this example, we forgot to add a semicolon after declaring and initializing the variable x, but JavaScript helps us out and adds one for us, so this code is executed as if we had put one there. Now, most of the time, automatic semicolon insertion does the right thing, but sometimes it can cause problems. Here, we've got a function that's computing a new level for a player and returning the value new level. You know that JavaScript is very forgiving about white space and most of the time doesn't care if we split statements over two lines of code, like we're doing here with the return statement. So this looks like it should work fine. Unfortunately, this is one place where automatic semicolon insertion does the wrong thing. What happens is that a semicolon is automatically inserted after the return statement. So your code behaves as if it was written like this. And that means you're going to be returning undefined from this function every time. And that's definitely not what you wanted. This is just one of several situations in which automatic semicolon insertion can cause problems, but it's probably the one that causes the most problems for new programmers.
Of course, the easy fix for this particular case of overzealous semicolon insertion is to write the return statement all on one line. So the best practice here is always use semicolons in JavaScript. Even though you don't absolutely need to, it's better not to trust that semicolons will be inserted in exactly the way you want them. And second, make yourself aware of where automatic semicolon insertion can happen in ways you don't expect, so you know when this can lead to unexpected behavior, like we saw with the return statement. Next, let's take a look at a couple of best practices that are related to efficiency. Here, we're processing an array by iterating over each array item and adding the item to a div element in the page. Each time through the loop, we get a div element from the DOM, add the contents of the array to the inner HTML property of the div, and then add a comma if the item is not the last one in the array. The first problem with this code is the line where we get the div from the DOM using getElementById. Notice that we're using the same div each time we iterate. In other words, the value of the div doesn't change at all, and yet we're recomputing it every iteration. Not only is this wasteful simply in terms of repeating a computation, it's especially wasteful because DOM access is relatively expensive in terms of compute time. So the first thing we can do to improve the efficiency of this code is to move this line above the for loop. This doesn't change the way the code works at all, but it can increase the speed of the code a lot. Next, notice that we're updating the inner HTML element of the div each time through the loop. Again, because DOM operations are fairly expensive, we can improve on this code by waiting until after the loop has completed before updating the div element. So we do this by creating a new variable message and building a string from the array elements that we temporarily store in message as we iterate. Once the loop is complete, we then set the inner HTML property of the div to message, reducing the number of DOM operations in this code from many to just two. So the best practice here is first to declare your variable outside loops whenever you can, and second to reduce DOM operations to a minimum. There are many other helpful best practices we could talk about, but I'll leave it here for now. If you're curious to learn more, just do a web search for best practices in JavaScript and you'll find lots of great information, as well as a lot of opinions. That's it for another installment of Headfirst JavaScript Programming Teasers.